Good evening, everyone. Mr. Woodhouse, distinguished guests, Dr. Helen Roberts, ladies and gentlemen, I'm George Benwell, Professor and Dean of the Otago Business School and Pro Vice Chancellor, Division of Commerce, but I only get three titles and one pay. <laughs> I'd like to wish you all a warm welcome um, for tonight's Winter Lecture Series event. And first of all, I'd like to pay um, recognition to where we stand, to Ngāti Toa uh, Rangatira, to Ati Awa, to Ngāti, uh, sorry, Rokawa, um, for the iwi of Wellington, Hutt Valley and Kapiti. Um, I acknowledge we stand in, in, in your areas. Secondly, I do acknowledge uh, that we stand also in the Faranui of the people of New Zealand, um, and thank you, Minister, for making that available. I'd also like to um, acknowledge what's important to us in this day when people blow everyone up at airports, when children get killed in a home, when countries... Um, don't want to be in Europe, or think that anyway. It's important that we recognise what is important. Her tangata, her tangata, her tangata. Thank you, Minister Woodhouse. On behalf of the University of Otago and the Vice Chancellor and Council, um, we thank you for hosting the 2016 uh, Winter Series lectures here in the House. The University is honoured to be able to hold um, this series in Parliament buildings and to you personally we thank you and to your colleagues. Before we move on um, to Dr Robert's lecture I'd like to give you um, just one or two minutes introduction to a few important things that are happening in the School of Business at the University of Otago because I would assume that you're all alumni or future students so we're in the business of education I pushed the wrong button. Here we go. This is a cross-section of this, the building that currently is called the Commerce Building, which will soon be called the Otago Business School. We are that, but the building is called Commerce and nobody knows what that is, so it'll soon be called the Otago Business School. And in coming weeks, starting sometime in August and completing in October 2017, approximately $15 million will be spent um, on modernising the building will create a modern learning environment and a home for our students. The building will become more accessible from street level, and pardon me, and I'll talk loudly. Currently, you have to come in at third level and then go back down, but there will be a, an entry at street level, and there will be a vista from the street level right through the building out to the river reserve on the waters of the leaf. The atrium, for those who know it, will become warm, dry, modern, and an inviting hub for our students. <coughs> Pardon me. And the upgrade, in the upgrade, sorry, the roof will become watertight. I've been at the university nearly 27 years, I think, and for 25 years, um, the roof has leaked. Our aim is to create an outstanding campus, and I'm sure the council and the vice-chancellor um, wish that all our students can partake in that outstanding campus environment and the building will offer warm social learning spaces for our students that encourage um, inquiring minds and a friendly culture. Hopefully, as I said, construction will conclude in October 2017 and after having been in the building for 25 years I will have retired nine months before that's been achieved. <laughs> Takes a while. Lastly and quickly, um, the business school has created or is developing to be technically correct, is creating New Zealand's only Doctor of Business Administration. There was one in the country previously, there is none now and within a few days Fingers crossed, QAP, the authority that approves new programs, academic programs in New Zealand, will approve the new program. It's a three-year degree. 
first year is uh, taught papers to teach students how to actually do research and then two-year thesis that is structured to allow students to continue to work and focus their assessment and research around their workplace and problems. It has a special focus on social, social responsibility and the developing of both public good and economic benefit through business improvement. Equally exciting and attached to that program is we have signed an MOU between um, Shanghai Xiaotong University in Shanghai and the Otago Business School where we will be delivering that program in Shanghai. Currently, um, well, t 10 days ago it was launched by the Mayor of Dunedin, um, Dave Cull. Um, over 200 alumni were at a session and a function in Shanghai. Um, we're quite excited about it. Shanghai Xiaotong University is one of the three or four top universities in Shanghai and they already have associations with other universities that you would recognise, Oxford, Cambridge, California, Berkeley and Toronto and we're adding Otago. Yes. This collaboration will help achieve our desire to export New Zealand's high quality education to China. I'd now like to turn and introduce We'll turn to and introduce the Minister, Michael Woodhouse, and thank you, Michael, again, um, who will introduce tonight's lecturer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora, George. Kia ora, tato katoa. Nga mihi ki e koutou. Uh, haere, haere, haere mai ki te whare panamata. Welcome to your place. Welcome back to those of you who have been participating in the 2016 University of Otago Winter Lecture Series. I think this is Lecture 3. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to firstly acknowledge Professor George Benwell. As most of you know, I'm very proudly uh, Dunedin born and raised, blue and gold in the veins, and alumnus of the University of Otago. But I can also add the fact that everything I've forgotten about information science, I learned from George. Um, it was a long time ago, actually, when I started my degree, the, um, I guess it was the Faculty of Commerce in those days, was in the, uh, adjacent to the old library on Albany Street, which is now the Information Services Building. So that's where I commenced my degree, and I uh, completed my degree shortly after the completion of this fantastic building. Fantastic but flawed uh, in, in its design and construction. Uh, and I must say I'm very grateful that the university is doing uh, some of this work uh, in my capacity as Minister of Workplace Relations and Safety. There have been some issues and uh, they are obviously going to be remedied. But I do think George would chuckle uh, at the revelation that uh, one of the least uh, high-performing students he had in 1991 is now the minister responsible for the single largest IT project embarked on in this country's public sector history uh, in the uh, Inland Revenue Business Transformation Project. It's a billion and a half dollars. And I'm, I, I jest, but actually the many learnings I had uh, in my commerce degree at the University of Otago is used every single day, including speaking the language of technology, which is so important, so ubiquitous in a modern environment, certainly in the public sector. But to tonight we're here to uh, listen to the presentation from Dr. Helen Roberts. Dr. Roberts is part of the Otago Business School's Department of Accountancy and Finance, where she is the senior lecturer for commerce students studying in their second, third and fourth years. Her research examines the relationship between CEO compensation, firm performance, and corporate governance. Since completing her doctoral studies, through which she focused her research towards publicly listed New Zealand firms, Dr. Roberts has extended her research to areas such as board structure and the relationship between ownership, asymmetric information, and corporate governance. As part of a longitudinal study carried out, we've heard that term in the winter series this year, haven't we? which looked at the period between 1997 and 2013, her research has compiled a wealth of data gleaned from annual reports and from New Zealand statistics to present a broad picture of trends 
for the cash and equity over time. This evening, Dr. Roberts will present her lecture, Power, Rigging and the New Zealand CEO, during which she will examine the growing gap between the pay of CEO and workers and the influence that CEOs exert on the pay setting process in New Zealand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Helen Roberts. Good evening and thank you so much for coming out to uh, listen to my lecture tonight. Thank you George and thank you Michael for your wonderful introduction and I will now get my pointer, there we go. So as uh, Michael has mentioned, Power Rigging and New Zealand CEO, so I have been developing a wealth of information in a a very well managed database that has been tracking what's been happening to executive compensation in New Zealand since 1997 and I'm going to share some of the information that I found from that research this evening. So just a little guide as to what you can expect tonight. So I'm going to give you an introduction, why it is I'm doing what I'm doing and uh, why I find it interesting. Tell you a little bit about CEO compensation in New Zealand. It's uh, similar in some ways to other westernised countries and different in others. And then I'm going to just give you a little bit of a hint as to why I think this is an important topic to be considering when we look at the gap and the growing gap between what CEOs are being paid in New Zealand and what an average income is like for an employee of these companies. I'll then talk about power, how the CEO has uh, the ability to influence pay setting process and rigging that could potentially happen within that process. Uh, I have developed some hypotheses, there's a little bit of a scientific methodology built into this presentation and I'll give you some results and some conclusions from what I've been looking at. So for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar as others with changes in the Companies Act, in 1997, there was a change to the Companies Act which required that for the first time ever a publicly listed company in New Zealand was required to disclose what their executive compensation was in each of their annual reports. All right, so what this meant under the new listing requirement was that if your firm was publicly trading on the New Zealand Stock Exchange and you had employees who were being paid more than $100,000 per year, then you needed to disclose how many employees were being paid in excess of 100,000 within $10,000 bandwidths. And in addition to that, you had to start disclosing what each of your directors was being paid. So if you had executive directors on your board who were being paid in excess of 100,000, then the exact amount that they were being paid would be disclosed in that information. All right, so prior to 1997, when we read those annual reports, we had no idea about what compensation levels were like. So what this disclosure meant was now anyone using that information would have uh, a better understanding about pay levels for that particular company. You also could find out if the CEO was a director, and of course if the CEO is a director, then we know exactly how much that individual is being paid. Um, and that had important value for both shareholders and for other stakeholders as well. It's allowed me as a researcher to look at what's happened to the level of CEO pay over time. And it's also allowed me to investigate relationships between what these individuals are being paid in terms of their level, what impact performance is having on that level of pay, and also to look at differences in pay based on the influence that the CEO might have in that pay setting process. All right, so it's a very uh, interesting area that um, I've been studying. So what I want to do is to walk you through several annual reports just for you to get a sense of what it's like to actually read these and understand what is going on. I'm just going to open up this link. This is going to take us into the main page of Z Energy. Z Energy is a recent new listing on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And we're going to open up the end report and just have a look at what the disclosures for CEO Mike Bennett's actually look like. <coughs> All right, so it's just going to open up. It's a PDF file. You can see there it's opening up. 
Now, the hard thing when you're doing this is you never know when you start what you're actually going to find and what you're, you're, you're looking for. So I'm just going to do a search initially for the CEO's name just to see what I can find because the, the hard thing about these documents is they can be between 80 and 100 pages long. So if you're trying to glean just certain amounts of information from them, you can spend quite a lot of time just going through them, trying to determine where it is that the disclosure for executive compensation is actually located. Right, so if we start to look, you can see there's a nice picture of all of the management team. And I'm going to keep searching. All right, so there is a description of uh, the CEO. It tells you a little bit about his history, what he did before he joined the company and his role within the company. little bit further you can see there's information about other directors in the company and uh, there's a disclosure there about Mr Bennett's compensation. You can see that he has a base salary of $725,000 and this is in 2015. Uh, he started working for the company in April of 2010. Now what's really interesting is when you start to read the, read the fine print $725,000 a year, he also has an annual STI. Now, STI is an acronym that means short-term incentive, all right? And that is a payment with an on-target value of 50% of his base salary and a maximum payment of up to 150% of his base salary. So what that means is in any given year, in addition to getting $725,000 in cash, he could get another one and a half times that amount as a short-term incentive, provided he meets the requirements that are determined by the board as to what qualifies him for that payment. All right, and then there's a little bit of talk about how the board has discretion about how that uh, payment will be assessed. And these payments are normally made ex post, so that means at the end of the financial year, the board will sit down and look at the key performance measures that it has de decided to assess performance on for the CEO, and the award is made in the first quarter of the following financial year. So there's a lag between when the award is um, being applied to, what time period it's being applied to, what financial year, and the financial year that the CEO actually receives the money. Alright, now in addition to that again there's another bullet point and it tells you that the CEO is also entitled to LTI payments, that means long term incentive payments. Alright, and they are also calculated against his base salary. Alright, so the, the, the theme that you will find as you start to read these is you'll find that the larger the base salary, the more the STI payout will be because it will be a proportion of base salary and the more the LTI payment could also be because, again, it will be based on that initial base salary. All right, and if you read down, you will see that the LTI payment to which Mr Bennett's may be entitled to in 2015 could total as much as $1.092 million. All right, so that's on top of everything else I've already referred to. Bennett's an entitlement to undertake what's called an RS LTIP, which is a restricted share long-term incentive plan. So basically they are going to allow him to be awarded some shares free of charge, which provided he manages the company well will also increase in value over time. And at some point in the future, if he so chooses, he will be able to sell those and convert them into cash. Right? And remember, there's no capital gains tax in New Zealand. So, hmm. All right. And, and the value of those awards, there are two of them. One is in 2016 for $428,532. And then there's one in 2017 for $485,747. All right, that's on top of everything else he is being awarded for 2015. Uh, now, Zed has also agreed to pay Mr. Bennett's reasonable accommodation and living expenses in Wellington. All right, this is a man who earns $725,000 a year. And reasonable 
travel expenses for national travel, particularly between Wellington and Auckland, but not restricted to those two locations. All right. So you can see that already it's a very complex process, all right, determining how these people will be paid and then trying to actually value all of that information on an annual basis and track what happens to it over time. So what I've got on the rest of the slide is just summarising that information that I've walked you through. So you can just have a, a look at it and remind yourself again. All right, so that's one company, and there are many companies that follow similar types of behaviour. Air New Zealand is another one. So Chris Luxon, who was recently appointed to the role of Chief Executive Officer at Air New Zealand, he has a base salary in 2015 of 1.4 million, and that was 1.3 to 5 million in 2014. So he's already had a bit of a jump in his base. He has, again, a short-term incentive scheme also, which ranges from 55 to 110% of whatever his base salary is. And in 2015, that equated to $1.54 million, and that, again, is in cash. Long-term incentives, again, are going to be offered. Now, in this case, the individual is receiving rights. There are different forms of equity incentives that boards will use. A right is really a contract that says at some point in the future you can convert this amount of money into shares and then you'll be able to sell them and get cash for them, all right? So uh, you can think of the value as essentially being a cash value that he is purchasing now but will be worth more in the future. And he also has his own equity uh, interest. He owns shares in the company himself and he's required to do that as part of his contract and he has to eventually hold 55% of his base salary and equity. At the moment, he had 37%. And in addition to that, he is also a member of a Kiwi Saver program with Air New Zealand, which is called Koru Save. And the company very kindly contributed to his retirement savings plan, $114,280. All right, so I won't bore you with all the details of every case. Um, this is a particularly interesting one because if you go and search for Adrian Littlewood in the Auckland International Airport Annual Report, you'll find very little information about him at all because he is only a CEO. He is not on his board, all right? He's not a director. So that means the disclosure requirements under the Companies Act from 1997 show that he only has to disclose within a $10,000 bandwidth if he earned money in that range. So it's very hard to discern exactly what his total pay is. And you can see that I have shown there total cash and equities based on the highest bandwidth, which for current employees in 2015 was between 2.25 and $2.26 million. All right, he also participates in an equity program called the Phantom Option Plan, which again is just sort of a fancy name for a way to own shares in the future, which at some point he will be able to sell. And because of the value of these, or the potential value of these, the board has actually decided to cap how much financial gain he can experience from these at two and a half times his award in 2012 and double the award in 2013 and 2014. All right, so again, significant amounts of money are being paid to these individuals. All right, last one we're going to look at is Spark. Spark, because it's a, a fairly new player in the exchange following the separation of Chorus and Spark from Telecom. Uh, so Simon Muta is the CEO and managing director. So he's a director, so it's much easier to assess exactly what he's being paid each year. So he's on a base of just over $1.4 million. He will receive an incentive for 2015, or he did receive $1.1325 million, and he hasn't earned an incentive in 2015, which will be paid in 2016. There's that delay of $825,000. Uh, he also has redeemable shares, which were awarded to him. All right, so again, he's got $906,000 equity in the company, and he has $1, 000, oh sorry, $1 million in performance rights, which again is another equity component. He has to wait for them to become eligible to actually convert into shares, and then if he chooses, he can sell those. 
So the idea of these equity incentives is to help these CEOs have flesh in the game, all right? So they are essentially shareholders. And by doing that, the board hopes that the decisions these individuals are making are in the best interests of the shareholder. All right, his take-home cash in 2015 was just over $2.5 million. And uh, he was also awarded an equity value in 2015, which was equivalent to $1.906 million, which is the combination of the $1 million in the performance rights and the $906,000 worth of shares. So you can see it's a very detailed process and it's one that involves a large amount of money and it spans several time periods. It's not easily identifiable and easy to calculate. You almost need to have a specialised degree in calculating the value of equity incentives to be able to even come up with a number that might be a fair estimate of the value that these individuals are being paid in any particular financial year. So what's actually happened to the value of CEO compensation over time? So I have now 17 years of data, and this graph is showing you from 1997 to 2013 on the x-axis, and on the y-axis I've got proportion measures, 10, 20, up to 100%, where the different colours capture the proportion of firms in that given year where the CEO was paid, and this is just cash, right? It's not including the value of shares or rights or options, where the CEO cash that was paid in total for that year as annual remuneration was at, at most 200,000, all right? So about 26, 27% of all CEOs in 1997 had a maximum of $200,000 cash in their pay package. In 2013, it was about 8%. All right, if we look at the top end, so now we're looking at CEOs who earned more than a quarter of a million dollars in cash in any given financial year, and you can see there was about 6% who fell into that category in 1997. In 2013, it was much bigger, it's about 28%. All right, so what we've seen is there has been a gradual shift to overall higher levels of pay with more CEOs at the end of 2013 earning pay packages that had a cash component in excess of half a million dollars. All right, so overall these individuals are, are being paid more and significantly more. Now what about wealth? Because wealth is a slightly different measure and boards include equity in the pay packages of these individuals, as I mentioned before, to try and give them some flesh in the game, to try and motivate them to think about what's going to happen to the value of the company and how that's going to impact the value of my equity in this company through the decisions that they make. Because they could be self-interested in only doing what benefits, what benefits them the most, in which case the shareholder is at risk of losing their own investment in the company. So wealth looks at the value of what they're paid in cash, plus the value of any new equity that they are awarded, plus the change in the value of any equity that they were awarded in a previous pay period. All right, so why they're holding rights or options or restricted share grants until they're allowed to exercise and convert those into shares which they can sell, those securities can change in value over time. They're affected by levels of interest rates, the risk-free rate, the volatility of returns on the company's stock over time, um, how long they can hold them until they expire, and the price of the stock in the market. All right, so they're quite risky investments. And if we take the value of all of the pay package into account, the story is the same. More CEOs are now earning higher levels of pay and the proportions are shifting quite dramatically, right? You can see it's still less than 10% are earning in that top bracket in 1997. But of course, when we move to 2013, we can see that now barely 7% of all CEOs earn at most $200,000 a year. All right, so they have become wealthier over time, and that's in terms of both cash and the true value of what they're being paid. So how does that compare to individual employees? When you think about employees of these companies, because what's becoming very uh, topical now 
is CEO worker pay levels, right? If you think about an average employee in any one of the companies that we've looked at so far, right? So Z Energy or Air New Zealand or Spark, all right? Auckland International Airport, what does an individual take home on an annual basis compared to what these CEOs are being paid? All right, so in this graph, what I'm showing you again is over time, over 17 years, and I'm looking in terms of real dollars in 1997, so this is adjusted for inflation. The blue line is the level of CEO cash, the red line takes into account the added value of equity incentives, and the green line is measuring changes in wealth, all right? So the overall impact on the well-being of the CEO as a result of those remuneration packages. And this very small purple line sitting against those big tall bars in the histogram is what's happening to median worker income, all right? And that's based on information from New Zealand statistics because these companies don't disclose uh, details about their individual employee income. But you can see that it's very, very small in relation. And if we actually do some numbers, uh, you will see that, in fact, the ratio, the difference, or the, the ratio of CEO pay to mean or median worker income, it doesn't really matter which one you take, is between 11 and, in this case, 17 to 15 times, but that's only based on cash. If I was instead to look at the level of wealth change, you'd find that that's close to about 22 times, right? So these individuals in 2013 were earning about 22 times what the median income for an employee in their company was earning, based on New Zealand statistics information. So there's a growing gap, and based on the levels that we're seeing reported in the most recent annual reports, which are up to 2015, the, tr the trend is continuing, right? These people are continuing to earn high base salary and then significant short-term and long-term incentives, both in terms of cash and equity. Now, CEO pay limits aren't just a concern or should not just be a concern for he us here in New Zealand. There are also questions being raised about the level of pay to these individuals in other countries around the world as well. So in the United States, in fact... Uh, since 2010, so following uh, the financial crisis and the intervention that was brought in through the Obama administration through the Sabanes-Oxley Act, which um, sought to highly disincentivise fraud and make accountable executives who chose to misrepresent information in their financial statements. Uh, in addition to that, there was a new law imposed called the Dodd-Frank Law. It was named by the two uh, individuals who brought it through the legal process. And it requires public company disclosure of CEO pay ratios in the annual report. And as yet, no publicly listed firm in the US has complied with that requirement. Right? These firms are challenging the need to report that information. They're saying it's too hard to know what a median worker income is. And it would not add any additional value to the information that's already been disclosed to the shareholder. So essentially they don't want readers of the annual reports to know what those ratios are like. Because if you look at something like Disney Corporation, those ratios can be as high as 2,000 times. Because these individuals are being paid such high levels, at such high levels. Switzerland as well, there's been concern about CEO pay and actually in... 2013, there was a national referendum. It had a participation rate of 65% where they asked individuals to vote on putting a cap on the pay level of CEOs at 12 times that of junior employees. Now, the referendum wasn't passed, um, but it was a very close. There was enough no's. 53% said no, much to the relief of many of the the large companies, there are 20 of the largest, highest paid CEOs in Europe are located in Switzerland. So it would have had a significant impact on compensation to those individuals. And uh, Switzerland's also the home to uh, UBS, which is a very well known uh, investment bank. And after the financial crisis, UBS had to be bailed out. And following that bailout, uh, a CEO tried to exit with a $78 million cash golden parachute. So even with laws in place to try and disincentivize this kind of behavior, it still perpetuates itself. And finally, Israel. 
Israel's parliament 2016, this is in March of this year, has just passed legislation that will cap uh, CEO pay levels in the finance industry at 35 times the gross income of the CEO's lowest paid employee. All right, and any access, if the company chooses to not abide by that ruling, any access will not be eligible as a legal expense for tax purposes. So the company will not be able to use access compensation payments for um, avoiding tax. All right, and in, believe it or not, there are actually companies in the world that are starting to take action on these access pay levels. So Dan Price from Gravity Payments, uh, he has decided to drop his $1 million pay package down to $70,000 US dollars per year. And the reason he's doing that is because he wants to make his pay level equitable with that of his employees. So there is a small video link there and I'm, I'm just going to summarise what the content is for you. So essentially in 2015 he got all his employees in a room and he said, my pay level is extremely high relative to what some of your take home pay packages are. I earn 22 times the lowest paid employee in my organisation. His company processes credit card payments for small to medium sized businesses. So he's not a very large business but he has been successful. So he chose to, to take a pay cut. He's dropped his annual income to $70,000 and from the day he made the announcement every employee in his company uh, entered into a, a pay package which guaranteed, guaranteed them at least $50,000 a year and his goal is by 2018 everyone in his company will earn at least $70,000 a year. So there are CEOs that do have a conscience out there. All right, so that now brings me to CEO power and rigging in a New Zealand context. So based on this background and the information that I have been able to um, glean and process and think about from annual reports for New Zealand executives, I ask the question, can CEOs with more influence over the pay setting process induce boards to shift the weighting to better performance measures and rig their incentive pay? All right, so the way the pay setting process works is the board will meet usually with a compensation consultant and based on advice from that consultant together with negotiations with the CEO, they will come up with a compensation package. And built into that compensation package, there will be understandings about how performance will be evaluated at the end of the financial year. None of those details are ever disclosed in the annual report, although there is reference made to them. So there is no ex-ante accountability as to whether the payments that are awarded and assessed at the end of the financial year can be assessed by an external party such as myself or a shareholder or any other stakeholder. All right, it also allows for a board to make or change decisions around awards of incentive payments and it allows the CEO to influence decisions about incentive payments because it's all private information. But the CEO is the individual who has the most information of anyone in the company about how the company is performing, how well it's likely to perform in the next 12 months, and what performance measures are going to look best when it comes to evaluating that performance. The other interesting thing about New Zealand is New Zealand has a diversified CEO board membership population. In the US and most westernised countries, every CEO will also be a director. In New Zealand, that's not the case. The split's about 60-40. 60% of CEOs will also be directors, but 40% will choose not to be on the board. So those 40%, we know a lot less about how much they're being paid and how they're being paid, all right? Because the disclosure requirement simply states you must say how many employees earn a certain amount of money between a $10,000 bandwidth. All right, we also know that boards will use a variety of measures to gauge how CEOs are performing. All right, it's not just one measure. It's not just return on assets. It's not just return on equity. It's not just earnings before depreciation and amortization. It's not earnings per share. It can be a whole range of measures. And as I just mentioned, CEOs are often able to discern how well they're doing and which performance measures are going to make them look better well before anybody else has any knowledge. And for that reason, CEOs may be able to influence the board either directly or else by executive directors who sit on the board if the CEO does not because the CEO helps to set the pay level of the executive director team. 
All right. So there's some cronyism going on here. If you help me, I can also help you. All right. So there is certainly a conflict of interest, although it's not widely acknowledged. I'm just going to give you a little bit of economic theory. So agency theory. So agency theory deals with the separation between owners of companies and managers of companies. All right, so if you think about a shareholder, so if I own shares in Telecom or Spark, all right, so I am essentially an owner of that company, although I'm probably a very small owner relative to the total number of shares on issue. So I put my trust, my faith on a day-to-day -day basis in the board to design a package that will motivate that CEO, that managing director, to act in my best interest, right? So to maximise the value of my investment over time, to manage risk well, to make decisions about good investments, which the ongoing value of the firm will reflect in over time, and I'll see high share price and good dividend payouts. The CEO, on the other hand, has a slightly different view of the world. All right, the CEO wants to achieve shareholder expectations, hopefully, but without compromising individual utility, all right, because the CEO is highly... Um, at risk in terms of holding large amounts of equity in a single company, right? So they don't have a diversified portfolio, both in terms of human capital and financial capital, because as you've seen, they have significant equity stake. And of course, um, their reputation really relies on the performance of the company during the time that they are in their position. So what does the board do? The board is responsible for designing governance structures and incentives that will try and help align the interests of the CEO to those of the shareholder. All right, That's what the board's ideal responsibility should be, together with being an eye on day-to-day -day performance uh, in terms of what the CEO is actually doing. As an individual shareholder, I receive news when it's released in the media, when the annual and interim reports are announced, and any other news releases that the company chooses to make public. Otherwise, I have no knowledge of what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So I have three hypotheses that I want to look at. The first one is CEO pay is not related to CEO power. So a CEO who has more influence is no more able to influence the amount that they are paid than a CEO who has very little influence. Because the pay should be set in an arm's length negotiating process, I should have no influence over how the CEO pay is determined. The second one, powerful CEOs cannot rig their pay. So in other words, they cannot manipulate the performance measure to have a higher overall pay level than they would otherwise have had if the performance measure had been set ex ante and was applied ex post based on the original contract. Right, so they're not able to influence the pay measures in terms of how performance awards are made. And finally, rigging is weaker among firms with strong governance or large institutional ownership. If you read some of the executive compensation literature, you will see that governance is a big factor in terms of determining how well the pay system works in reality. And together with that, individual shareholders Little mum and dad shareholders have very little impact in terms of standing up at the annual general meeting and saying, I disagree. Institutional shareholders, on the other hand, that have a significant shareholding in a company, if they voice a concern or are willing to monitor what's going on in the firm, they can have an impact on what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. All right? So there are some ways of trying to monitor and control what's happening, but usually it's at an institutional level rather than an individual shareholder level. So I have data, right? I have compensation data. I have information about whether the CEO is on the board. And what I do is I use this data to come up with different measures of CEO power because there's no one defined measure of how to measure the power that the CEO can influence over pay setting. So I use, sorry, I use uh, measures of whether the CEO sits on the board, and there's evidence in the literature to suggest that CEO board members are more influential than those that are not. If the CEO is also chairman of the board, which up until quite recently was quite common in New Zealand, but under the best practice code that's now strongly discouraged. If there are executive directors, right, so if you've got managers who are also directors, they can influence the rest of the board and they can also bring your best interest to the board and influence the way pay is structured. 
The size of the board, larger boards, uh, psychology literature will tell us that if you've got eight members on a board, it's so less likely that one director is going to stand up and say, I don't agree because that's going against the majority and that director wants to maintain that directorship and other potential directorships in the future. So if you become a noisy director, you're going to lose opportunities to be director, a director on other boards very quickly. Uh, is the CEO on the compensation committee? You might think, my goodness, that could never happen. It happens and it still happens in New Zealand. Barno Healthcare, up until recently, Alan Clark sat on every compensation committee meeting before he left Abano Healthcare, even though it's just strongly discouraged now. And there are some CEOs who are de facto members of compensation committees, which means they're not true members, but they still attend the meetings. All right, and finally, our board appointments during tenure. So while you're a CEO, if you appoint someone to the board, chances are they're going to look on you more favourably than if they were appointed under another CEO, all right? There's some evidence in the literature to suggest that can also be a, a factor in terms of measuring power. In addition to those power measures, I control for things like equity components in the pay package, the firm performance. So I have a measure for short term, which is return on assets, which is simply the earnings before interest and tax divided by the total assets measured in the book value of the balance sheet. All right, so what's happened in the last 12 months, essentially. And stock market return, which is more of a long-term measure. Um, I control for firm size. I control for equity ownership, how long the CEO has been there, how volatile the share return is, and also the governance strength and the institutional ownership. So a little bit of, little bit of maths, not too much, all right? So I'm just going to walk you through and I'm going to tell you what's important here and then we'll look at some results. So this is a, an equation and what it's saying is the compensation of firm I in year T is, this is like an intercept term, you think of a straight line, and what I do is I allow each firm to have a different intercept term because firms can vary, all right? So it allows a variation in the level of firm pay over time. And then I have a coefficient times that power measure, all right? So I talked about different ways CEOs can exert power, and I actually have five different m ways of measuring power, and I test each of those and see if I get consistent results. And then I have... Uh, these standardized, standardized measures of short and long-term performance because I, what I want to do is be able to compare sensitivity to performance across all the companies. And you can imagine some companies are really big, they have really high ROAs. Some companies are very small and they have very low ROAs or very poor long-term performance measures at the moment because they're just starting up. So what I do is I standardize all those performance measures so they're all measured relative to a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Because what I'm really interested in asking is, does this power parameter have an impact on compensation? And if these return measures are jumping around all over the place, I'm not going to be able to isolate the effect of power. So I have these standardized measures of performance. And then I have controls for like size and volatility and how long the CEO has been there and what the equity component of the pay is. And I also have a variable here that controls for each year of my sample because Strange things can happen in some years, and it could just be we're observing a financial crisis that year. So that's driven the result, right? So I want to try and avoid those random effects that might bring me spurious results. All right, so that's my first relationship. Does power influence CEO pay? And the second one is saying, in addition to more power leading to higher pay, can the CEO rig their pay? So in other words, if they're more powerful... Are they able to influence by choosing the maximum performance measure to impact how much they're paid, all right? So if you're powerful, this power measure is going to have a value other than zero. If you're not powerful, the power measure will have either a low value or a value of zero. So the more powerful you are, what influence does choosing between the higher of the two returns have on pay? So the take-home message is we want to look at the value of alpha one, and we want to know is that positive and significant from a statistical point of view. And then we want to look at the coefficient alpha 4. And we're asking the same thing. Is that positive and significant? And then after we've done that, I go and I look at governance. And I say, well, if these firms are strongly governed or weakly governed, does that affect this relationship? Do we see rigging more when there's weak governance 
and less when there's strong governance. And equally, when we have institutional ownership, those institutions should be monitoring because they have the money and they have the ability to monitor on a daily basis what these CEOs are doing. Does that also influ influence that relationship between what these CEOs are being paid and their ability to rig their pay? All right, so the measures you've already seen, I've got cash, I've got cash plus new equity, I've got cash plus new equity and the change in equity. I've got some power measures which are based on if the CEO is a, a director, if the CEO is a chairman, if the CEO sits on their own compensation committee, if the board size is higher than the median board size in any given year, and if the number of insiders on the board is higher than the median in any given year. In other words, the higher the power measure, the greater influence the CEO potentially can have on the pay setting process. So let's look at some results. All right, so I have seven different models here. And what I'm measuring, I'm measuring total compensation, which is cash plus equity. All right, it doesn't really make sense to look at wealth because wealth can fluctuate based on previous equity issues. So we're just looking at new pay awards, both in terms of cash and equity. And I have some different measures of pay. These first seven variables are measures of pay. So I've got a power index, which is looking at the individual's ability to manipulate pay based on their involvement in the board. And then I just look at some individual measures of power, like the proportion of inside directors, if the CEO is on the committee that sets the pay level, the size of the board, if the CEO is a chairman, and if the CEO is on the board. And then I make an index using five of these measures and the higher the index, the more power the CEO is able to exert on the pay setting process. And then I've got some controls. I've got controls for performance, controls for size of the firm, controls for volatility on returns on those shares, um, ownership, because there's some literature that says there's an optimal amount of equity that a CEO should own, and after that, the CEO will become entrenched and just consume for perquisite benefit, right? They won't really care about what it does, what the CEO decision does to the company. They'll just keep making decisions that benefit them. And we control for how long the CEO's been there. And what do we see? We see in one, two, three, four, five of those power measures are highly significant. So that's telling us that more powerful CEOs in New Zealand are able to influence their level of pay. All right, so that's the first main result. So now we want to look at rigging. We want to see if we select the maximum of the short and long-term performance measure and if the CEO is also powerful, is that significant? All right, so we have the individual maximum performance measure. Yes, that influences the level of pay. Power also influences pay. And we see that in some of the power and, and measures, but not all of them, but for uh, board size, for firms where the CEO is also a chairman, and in cases where the board is large, right? The board size is larger than the median, we find that there is evidence of rigging, all right? So that interaction between the maximum return measure and the CEO power level is significant and positive. So not only can more powerful CEOs influence how much they're paid, they also have the potential to rig, all right? So to predetermine through their influence over the board which performance measure in any given year will determine their maximum short-term and long-term incentive payouts. Now we do some robustness tests around those results. I don't only have those two results, but I thought that was probably enough for you to see that there are significant results. So the last hypothesis looks at this role of governance. And I form a, an index which looks at um, various measures of governance within the firm. So a firm that has a low score on the index is well governed. A firm that has a high score on the index has weak governance. And when we run that same model, I haven't got all the controls here, but we look at that rigging, right? So a maximum performance measure interacted with the power that the CEO can influence. Both the higher the pay performance measure, the higher the CEO gets paid, but also the CEO's power is able to influence that level of pay is significant for every power index in firms that have poor governance. 
All right, so firms where you have a CEO who's sitting on their board, where you have a large board size, or you have a CEO sitting on a compensation committee, you find greater effect of rigging. High governance firms, the only time where it seems to be an issue is when you've got a very large board size, a, si a board that's got a size that's on average bigger than the median. And then we do the same thing again, or I do the same thing again, but this time I'm now looking at institutional ownership and are institutional investors able to monitor pay levels and influence whether or not CEOs are able to rig. So we see there's the maximum performance measure, there's the power measure, and we see that some of those rigging variables are again significant. So a consistent story, we've got weaker governance, weaker monitoring, you see that there is a possibility for CEOs to be able to extract higher levels of pay. Um, and there's a little bit of evidence um, present for institutional holdings that are high as well, but only in one or two of the um, power cases, not all of them, all right? So it tends to suggest that when you've got poorer governance or lower institutional shareholding, there's often a higher incidence of CEOs both having power to influence their pay and also rig their pay. All right, so what are my results telling me? Well, they suggest that on average, powerful CEOs are able to rig their pay. And it seems that um, the pay is more sensitive to the better performance measure, right? So when we look at the max between the short-term and the long-term performance measure, that variable is usually significant, suggesting that pay is highly associated with better performance. Uh, rigging is associated with CEOs that have a high power index score and particularly firms with a board size that's greater than the sample median and CEOs who sit on their own boards, right? So those firms in particular, we find that CEOs tend to have a higher influence on the pay setting process. Weak governance supports rigging, all right? So if you've got a firm where you haven't got good governance in place, you're more likely to see evidence of rigging. And that last result that I just pointed out to you where typically high institu institutional ownership, ownership reduces rigging except in the case where you've got very large boards. And even then, it's possible that the CEO is able to rig their compensation. So what does this mean for CEO pay in New Zealand? Well, all we can say really is that on average we know powerful CEOs do engage in rigging. Can I actually point my finger tonight and tell you which company, which CEO? No, I can't, all right? It's very hard to detect when rigging is going on in practice and which CEOs are involved, all right? And it is even the case that some CEOs and boards will want to camouflage access compensation, right? There's cronyism going on. And that makes it even harder for CEOs to be able to identify when this is a problem. Possible solutions, collective action against rigging. It's often difficult, high legal costs involved. So for individual shareholders, it's very hard to do. And it means bringing a class to action. And often it's hard to replace powerful CEOs. They will counterattack any claims um, brought against them concerning rigging. Solution. Well, policy that encourages direct disclosure of ex-ante incentive pay contracts would be ideal, all right? So very much uh, an issue around transparency, so making it very clear from the very beginning when the contract is set, beginning of the financial year, what performance measures are going to be used in the assessment, and then they are reported very clearly in the annual report for all of the shareholders to be able to read and um, understand. Strong governance and more independent boards can reduce, reduce contract rigging, all right? So making sure that boards are doing what they're supposed to be doing and that governance structures are in place that encourage the best possible practice that would be most acceptable. All right, so I'm now more than happy to take questions and I thank you so much for your attention. We have a roving microphone here, so Lisa will bring the microphone to you if you want to ask a question. 
Oh yeah, there's one there at the front. Great. Yeah, and one at the back too. Uh, thank you for. Uh, yeah. Thank you for um, tackling this very important topic. Um, my feeling is that there are some questions that you haven't raised. One mm -hmm. is how to get the best people at the top. Right. And it seems to me that a large salary isn't necessarily it. Mm -hmm. The second one is I think rigging is only part of the problem. I think that the there should be a cap. There if should it should be, be a some, cap? Some kind of a cap related mm -hmm. to the lowest uh, salary or the mean salary. And this rigging is, I would say, well, well perhaps you could answer. What mm -hmm. do you think, what proportion of the salary is affected by this? Uh, I could, I actually, I, I should have done that. I can estimate that from the models. I can take the coefficients and I can estimate it. But I would say that it could be in the order of up to half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. For some companies, not all companies, but for some companies, if I take uh, their, their median performance measure and then use that together with the coefficients from the model, I could estimate, yeah, within one standard deviation, how much of an influence it has on the overall pay level. Yes. Uh, and getting the right person, I agree. I mean, part of the argument in New Zealand is that we have a small pool of talent. You know, it's very hard to attract these people. And you might agree or disagree. And I would argue that I don't necessarily agree with that either. And you have some fat cats. You know, they have been around long enough now that uh, they have experience. And they can use that in their negotiating to be able to get a base salary that's a lot higher than, you know, a new startup, a company that's just been publicly listed, that's much more risky, and they just don't have the cash flow to support high payouts. And I think the other part of the story, which isn't addressed here, but also needs to be looked at, is the role of compensation consultants in the setting of executive compensation, uh, because they also have a vested interest in maintaining relationships with companies who have boards that each year need to revisit how much we pay our executive team and how do we determine what that amount should be and what the components of that pay package should look like. And they base their assessment on the median pay level within the sector. And every year, if every CEO gets a new higher base salary, and we saw that in one of my examples, all right, the average for the sector goes up. So that then becomes the new benchmark which every company in that sector will use to set the base salary for their CEO going into the subsequent financial year. So there's a ratcheting effect that goes on within the whole pay setting process. Mm -hmm. So you're right, yeah, there's still lots of questions to be asked. Mm -hmm. Good points. I think you may. You may have already asked, uh, answered the question I was going to ask. Do you think it's possible that disclosure requirements have caused this increase in the gap between the top executive pays and the uh, average worker pay? Um, just the mere fact that there's a, an, arms, like an arms race going on at the top end. Yeah, possibly. And although I think in some ways the disclosure makes it easier to hide because if you're a CEO and you're not on your own board then the disclosure is minimal, really. I mean, it's like Adrian Littlewood, you know, it's just between 2 point, whatever it was, 2.25, 2.26 million, I don't really know, other than that, um, how much he's getting paid in any given year. And I can only discern that from that list of employees and based on what is in the annual report, I know it can't be any of the other pay levels below that, so I have to assume that that's his pay level. So uh, there is an element of secrecy, which means that I don't know what goes on behind closed doors when the board makes that decision. And actually, if you asked a director, honestly, they would say, we really don't know how to set pay. They rely a lot on the compensation consultant. And the compensation consultant relies a lot on the survey data that they get each year from the companies who they then consult with in the following year. So there's a lot of, yeah, breakdown in the whole arm's length negotiating process. Mm -hmm. But I think there's just some genuine accountability that needs to be brought into this as well. Mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion. Though. Oh, there's a gentleman at the back and then there's another one at the front. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, could you tell me, you've done excellent work. Uh, Thank you. Where will it go this way? Who will take it up and make use of it? 
And another question, if mm -hmm. I may ask, who developed these enormous bonuses, the idea of these uh, bonuses? Because I've worked for about 50 years, I didn't get a, never got a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I know, and you know, classic example, you know, Teresa Gatung, before she left Telecom, she was taking home $50,000 a week. You know, it's just, but individuals don't realise this, and the way it's reported in the annual reports, it's, it's really hard work to get this information out. So I think there needs to be work done on how the information is being disclosed, and maybe shareholders, I don't know who, raises the question of, are CEO pay levels in New Zealand too high? One CEO has asked that question, that's Gary Powell, who has just stepped down from the warehouse. But uh, he has said publicly, I've heard him say, that he felt that he was being paid too much for what he did. Mm -hmm. so, and where will this, hopefully this will be published and hopefully I can get it into the media and we can create some conversation around how these people, I'm not saying they're being paid too much, but I think it's a question that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a very, very short question on language. Why do you use the word compensation, which generally inf implies that someone suffered some injury or insult? <laughs> oh, right. I think it's just the academic literature. It tends to be either, and if you read an annual report, it's usually if I have to search, I either search for CEO compensation or CEO remuneration. They are the two labels that are used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're right. It's very misleading when I think about it. Mm -hmm. I, oh. Okay, I was going to ask about taxation, but uh, I also wonder whether... Gary Powell and Gareth Morgan, who both protested that they get too much, mm -hmm. whether that has had any influence on those, um, you know, um, equations or whatever uh, that you're doing. But yes. to get back to um, taxation, uh, when you offload, as it were, more and more onto performance pay, mm -hmm. uh, does that affect taxation? And also, if Joe Bloggs decides to uh, get um, shares instead of dividends, you still pay tax. What happens uh, way up at the higher echelons here of mm -hmm. shares given to CEOs? Mm -hmm. See, the interesting thing with the equity is when they are awarded, they normally have to vest. So until they are actually available to be converted into equity, I don't think that they're taxable. All right, because the CEO has to meet certain performance criteria in order for them to vest. So he will be or she will be awarded a certain package and within that package it might be 3 million options and 1 million of those will vest each year for the next three years. And once they're vested, then they're actually allowed to decide, do I want to use this contract to buy shares in the company? Because sometimes they expire worthless. They don't all um, turn into equity. The capital gains on the equity when they sell them are zero, right? So there's no tax on any capital gain that they make, but anything that's taxable in terms of a, an award, which is realised, uh, would be yeah taxed at whatever the highest tax level is. Although many of these people have trusts and things, so... Yes, so anything that's cash would be taxable in the year it's earned. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, if I understood what you said mm -hmm. and, you, and your charts, mm -hmm. you proved that um, some measure of rigging is going on. Mm -hmm. That's right, on average, yes. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, looking forward to future work, mm -hmm. Have you considered how you might compute the odds that an individual uh, company had rigged their compensation and, um, uh, you know, so that one could say, oh, well, there's only a 2% a, a, a chance that right. this one was rigged or <laughs> there's only a 4% a chance that this one wasn't rigged. Right. Um, that would be a, a useful sort of thing. Sure. And while you're at it, uh, you might also work on um, what value the CEO presumably does bring mm -hmm. 
if there was a way to measure that. Right. Good. No, there's good suggestions. And certainly, yeah, I could look at uh, the what factors are going to increase the likelihood of rigging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it seems from your work that institutional investors or in, um, shareholders could have a they significant could. effect. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess two questions. Um, the one is, are there any legal restrictions mm-hmm. on how much an institution can invest in a particular company? Okay. Yeah. Um, and is there any evidence that institutional investors have moved to limit CEO payments? Oh yeah, good. So in New Zealand, the uh, if you trade more than 10% of the equity on issue at any given time, you have to declare intention before you trade. So that would be the only legal, it's not a legal restriction, but because if you start to trade more than 10%, it can have a significant effect on the share price if you buy or sell. Because obviously if you increase demand for the share, it's going to push the price up. You know, you're trading enough shares in one go. Uh, So legally there's no other requirement other than the majority shareholders in the company might suddenly start paying attention if some outside institutional investor buys up big amounts of shares very quickly because it could uh, indicate takeover activity and that would make the CEO very scared, right? So uh, labour market control can have an important um, monitoring effect, I guess, because if the firm is being mismanaged, if the CEO is abusing that power role to the extent that the value of the company is being compromised, then it becomes a takeover target. And that's when, you know, you can see institutional investors having um, a real impact because they'll come in and, and they'll buy out the company and then they'll replace the management. I guess um, another point to that is um, institutional investors should la- look after the money of the people that are investing in them. Mm-hmm. So That's they should, right. They should have an incentive then That's right. to actually make sure the companies they invest in do perform Yes. and that CEOs are not uh, overly rewarded. Right. I, I don't see any evidence that that happens. Yes, no, and probably it's... More typically, institutional investors will just walk, right? They'll just take their money out rather than go through the legal process of contesting yeah, something that they necessarily see as being poor management. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Right, good. Mm-hmm. Um, hi, my question is um, like what Israel has done past uh, um, in the parliament. Yes. Do you think New Zealand government would do that or would do your research uh, make uh, the... Um, member of parliaments to think about that and mm, I think I mean you know Israel is a small country you know they had a national referendum and they have made this their new a new law right so I, I I think it's not impossible in New Zealand if Israel can do it there's no reason why New Zealand couldn't I think it's a question that should be addressed and I think probably enough individuals aren't aware of the pay levels of these individuals because mm-hmm. to read the annual reports is very time consuming and it's very confusing you really need some I mean I, I don't want to say I'm an expert but I'm used to reading these things and I can even like I read it two or three times before I actually understand how the pay is even structured let alone how much it's actually worth mm-hmm. yeah so I think it's it's something New Zealand needs to look at yes hi Alan Max Rashbrook here thanks very much for your presentation um, just a couple of questions from your results, would you say that if New Zealand firms all shifted themselves to the sort of ideal governance standards, mm-hmm. to what extent, I mean completely or partially, would the issues about rigging disappear? Um, and then a second question on reporting. In the UK, the high pay centre has said that basically companies should be limited to one base measure and maybe one performance measure, and that's it, particularly... To because it's just so very difficult to understand what on earth is going on with compensation a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are your thoughts on that or any other reporting things other than what you mentioned in terms of the ex-ante stuff? All right, so um, so the first one is about the... Right, the governance standards. Mm -hmm. So a best practice code came in in 2004 and 
great initiative, but actually only two of them are mandatory. And one of them, most firms probably complied with already, which was the audit committee requirement, and you have to have now someone who has a CA or an FCA, you know, someone who actually can truly audit financial statements. You can't just be on that committee for the sake of being on a committee, all right? Uh, and the other best practice code was around independence on the board. So now you have to have at least two independent directors. If you have eight or more directors on your board, you have to have at least three or a minimum of a third of the board has to be deemed independent and it has to be declared in your annual report. So I think that's helped and certainly firms are disclosing that in their annual reports. But I still think that directors don't necessarily have the knowledge and the training to be able to set compensation, especially, you know, the way it's being said at the moment, that, that the expertise that's needed. I think they are trying to do the best they can. They want to motivate these individuals to act in the best interest of the shareholder. And I think, yeah, more governance and uh, more uh, monitoring of how, how CEO involvement is being carried out with, within the firm and within the board around these decisions would be helpful. What that looks like, I'm not so sure. And, you know, it's a free economy too, so you don't want to lock everything up so much. And having single measures, uh, yeah, I don't think companies would ever agree to that, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, final question, great. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's um, extremely insightful and, and um, yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, just looking to the, to the future from your data and stuff like that, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the balance of power, you say if you're CEO and you're on a board, um, with the recent health and safety uh, mm -hmm. introductions and the, the, we'll call it the Peter Jackson effect, Mm. of removing himself from the directorships um, for fear of risk and prosecutions. Right. Is that potentially something that may shift the, the power imbalance or the, 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 the power issue you're, you're relating to moving forward um, where they could potentially, well, you know, you mentioned that they, they understand the business and they know where it's going and they want to drive it. Well, mm -hmm. a judge might sit there and sit there and say, well, actually, you are there driving it and you should know better and right. you're, you're doubly at risk, so that might shift the, the balance. Yes. Um, and the other point, you uh, you made something about the USA being able, unable to disclose, which got me thinking, mm. having lived in uh, North America for three years, that a lot of employees um, have a sort of a $10 an hour wage, but they get a, get tips and stuff which takes it up, which would make it difficult. So mm -hmm. for those employees, are we likely to see changes in the employment space where they're looking to more tips and, and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, to try and bring their wages up, not obviously not to 22% of what the C is. Right. <laughs> just interested in the two thoughts on the shift in power and okay. the future for employees. Right, yeah. And I think my intuition tells me if I'm a CEO who doesn't sit on my board, uh, I have the ability to do a lot more than the majority of the shareholders know because it's just not going to be disclosed in the annual report to the degree, to the detail uh, that me as a, an individual reader can then look at and assess, all right? It's just very, very opaque what's actually going on, how decisions are being made, what's being paid when and why. So I think you might see a shift off the board, yeah, if there's more vigilance paid to how these individuals are being compensated. Um, in the US, it's the service sector where the tipping is really critical, actually, right? So especially waiting, waiting staff, if they don't get tips, they don't basically earn enough to live on. Um, so it's an expected part of that payment structure. Uh, the example I showed you, the gravity payment, uh, Dan, who's just decided to take a $70,000 um, annual salary and make sure all his other employees are at that level within three years. I think um, that that could be real for New Zealand. You know, we have a lot of people in poverty already and that's not going to go away. And I think if everyone can enjoy uh, a living wage, a living income, I think that would be amazing. And it's not impossible. It just means some people have to say, I'm not going to have as much money in the future as I have in the past. But they've already got accumulated wealth. They're not really losing. They're just not getting as much as they used to get. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Wind up. Wind up. <laughs> Helen, thank you. Uh, you can see the lights going and the bells going, which means that MPs need to be going to the chamber. But of course, we will uh, hopefully all of us take a leisurely stroll to the west wing and have some refreshments.
Can I just make a couple of observations about some of the questions? Um, firstly, in my capacity as Minister for Workplace Relations and Safety, uh, I have a very strong view as a former CEO and an employer of many staff that compensation by other than base salary for the vast majority of our workers is not something that New Zealanders culturally accept. So tipping and hospitality tends not to be a widespread part of our remuneration, and I don't expect that to change. Our, our minimum wage is twice that of the United States nearly, a and uh, I certainly would hate to think that that was um, creeping in. As far as the Peter Jackson effect on boards of changes not only to health and safety but to other expectations on governance. I think that was a misreporting um, but nevertheless a concern. What I think Helen's research has shown very clearly in an extremely scientific manner is that uh, independence and good governance matter. Independence of the CEO from the governors uh, and the quality of governance is, is really important. We started, I started this morning with my colleague Louise Upston, the Minister for Women, uh, at the Institute of Directors, launching an expanded future directors program aimed at bringing greater diversity onto New Zealand's boards, not just in gender, but ethnically, geographically and in age. Because what we know is that boards that all look like me aren't nearly as effective as boards that look more like New Zealand. And I think we need to make sure that we have the quality of governance maintained and approved, um, and, and diversity will be one way of doing that. The last thing I would just add, um, in respect of employee share schemes, short-term income from shares and share options, is that, um, I'm also Minister of Revenue, uh, the Inland Revenue is currently consulting on changes to rules around the taxation of employee share schemes, and the primary purpose of that review is to make a more enabling framework. Because what we know is that for many uh, startup companies, particularly in the tech sector, share schemes for employees, not just executive remuneration, but for, you know, we see it in bus drivers here in Wellington, we see it at Zero. we see it at some of the IT startups that we've got in Dunedin. They're really, really important at attracting and re retaining not just the executives, but the people at the coalface. What it's also doing, though, is identifying and actually stamping out some of the negative aspects of employee share schemes that are designed to avoid tax. And there are share option arrangements and interest-free loans uh, that create the appearance of ta capital gain, which in shares is generally tax-free in New Zealand, when in fact it's actually income. And so that very point is being considered by Inland Revenue right now as an important way to improve the access to employee share schemes because we think they're very good vehicles, but also to stamp out a bit of a loophole that's there as well. So I hate to sort of come in and give a little mini lecture at the end, but I thought it would be helpful just to round off those questions, those very good questions, with some observations uh, of my own. Helen, thank you. Thank you for an incredibly insightful and interesting uh, insight into... Uh, an area of compensation that the overwhelming majority of New Zealanders will never be troubled by. Um, it's almost a bit like winning lotto, becoming CE of some of these companies. Uh, but very important, nevertheless, that this research has continued. So on uh, your behalf, please join me in thanking Dr. Helen Roberts.